Awesome, thank you all for joining. We're gonna get started now. My name is Sam Sugarman. I'm the sustainability manager for the Toro Company. Um, we have an exciting panel to talk about agricultural plastic collection programs and schemes. Um, I don't really wanna to take too much of the time away from that, so all I'm gonna say is the best determinant of a circular economy is making sure that the closed loop is, is catalyzed by people picking up the material and sending it down the reverse channel. And this whole conversation is about schemes and mechanisms to get it down the reverse channel and back into a circular system. Um, so with that, um, uh, I want to give the floor over to Jan Bauer, uh, the managing director with RIGK out of Germany. And he's going to give a presentation on collection systems for agricultural plastics in Europe and the German ERDE system. So thank you, uh, Sam, for the nice introduction, and um, also thanks to Jean for the organization and the invitation to speak. I'm going to talk uh, about the German um, collection system for agricultural films um, called Erde. Erde means in, in German like um, soil, and um, we, but we're not hoping to collect too much soil, more plastics. Um, before that, I would start with a little presentation of our company or our group, RGK. So RGK was founded in 1992, so more than 30 years on the market. Um, we have uh, 96 employees in the moment in Europe. Um, not only Germany is the headquarter, but we have a subsidiary in Romania and an agency in Spain. And we have um, daughter companies. Uh, one is uh, called Hannawald. It's a plastic sorting company uh, for commercial and industrial uh, plastic packaging and a startup um, called Plastchip. Uh, Plastchip is a platform to sell um, plastic recyclates back to the market and to match between converters and recyclers. But our main business um, of RGK is actually the operation of EPR systems. So we are operating eight collection systems in Germany and one in Switzerland. And we have more than 60, uh, 66,000 customers um, and we are uh, TIF certificated. Yeah, where we are coming from, um, our shareholders are companies out of the plastics industry. So um, first, they, uh, there's the, the first group is plastics producers, producers of uh, virgin resins and producers of industrial packaging. I think all of them are also very active in the US market. So why did they found RGK? Because the, there was a new law coming into force in Germany in 1992 about the collection of packaging, um, Verpackungsgesetz, where the a filler of a packaging has to take back its packaging from the client, so total, uh -huh. clear EPR law, and um, the industry doesn't want to give everything to the disposal companies, so they said we want to have our own system managed by, by us, and so they founded RGK. So the core or the heart of our companies uh, are our employees for sure, and we are very happy that we are a great place to work and um, that, this, that our company is growing every year, so we will get more folks in our team. We, as I already said, we're operating eight systems in Germany, nine in total, and um, we operate three systems um, that take back industrial plastic packaging from the, mainly from the chemical industry, but I'm not going to talk about this today because we are on an agricultural plastics conference. And there we are now operating <clears throat> actually six systems. So um, we operate the Pamira system, which is uh, similar to ACRC. So we collect um, crop protection packaging there all over Germany. And we have a separate small system for the collection of seed dressing packaging. So this is a special uh, chemical that is, used, uh, that is used for seed dressing. And um, the material is very colorful, so it's red. So we won't mix it with the normal pesticide packaging waste stream. So it's a separate system. Then last year we had the first uh, collection period for the Verena system, which is a collection system for super sex. Uh, for mainly for seeds and um, for fertilizers. And we are collecting also the 
um, old agricultural chemicals or pesticides that cannot be used anymore um, from the market. And last but not least, and that's the topic for today mainly, is the collection initiative for agricultural plastics. So that means everything that is not packaging is collected in Erde. <clears throat> Yeah, in Erde we have, first of all, um, the most important parts of the system are our members. We have uh, 26 of them now. These are all companies that produce um, agricultural plastics, so mainly film producers, but also net twine um, producers. Um, and also, uh, we have also Klaas as a big, big brand um, that also sell uh, films on their own brand in the market. So they are mainly financing um, the whole system. Yeah, what do we collect? So we collect, um, first of all, silage films. So uh, <coughs> clump silage film and stretch film, but also nets and twines. We also collect uh, the asparagus film. In Germany, we have a lot of asparagus grower. We are we're growing the, the white asparagus there. We collect a little bit of non-woven. Um, materials out of PP and perforated films and also a little bit of mulching, which is not the biggest faction in Germany. So how do we collect this uh, on the German market? We have actually two different ways to collect. The first one is we uh, collect the material at fixed collection points via collection periods throughout the year. And there you see the number, um, how they developed. So in 2014, where we had only 128 collection points, now we are um, at more than, um, because the 2023 figure, now we are almost at 700 um, collection points throughout Germany. These collection points can be distributors mainly, so that means the companies that sell the film or the plastics, they collect it on their yards and then we have machinery rings. Um, these are associations of farmers where they share machines and also um, um, uh, offer services for communities, for example. And they, they also offer the service to collect the material on their yards um, for their members, which functions very well. Of course, we have also uh, farmers that, that do the collection and uh, contractors. And when it comes to the other part of the collection, um, the mobile collection, um, there um, mostly the disposal companies go directly to the farms um, and collect um, the films and plastics on farm. Yeah. And there uh, we can also see that we started in 2016 with the mobile collections and now reached a figure um, much higher than 3,200 um, mobile collections throughout Germany. Here you see uh, on the map, on the right side, you see that it's spread all over Germany. But of course, we have some um, very active areas where a lot of film is coming back and where, uh, for example, um, a lot of uh, cow farming is active or also um, cattle farming or also um, the horticulture sector, which is more on the west side of Germany. So when we take a look at, at some volumes, um, biggest fraction in Germany, um, almost 60% of all the film is silage and stretch films or silage, clump silage and stretch films, bale wrap film. Um, we collected uh, last year uh, 35,500 uh, tons, which is actually more than 70% of the whole market. Um, there um, we are already uh, <clears throat> we, we, we are there, the, the, the contamination is already excluded in this figure. And all the material um, went to uh, EU recycling facilities, so, so the 35,000 tons are recycled in the EU. Um, we already talked about it in the moment, it's not, not possible anymore to, to export the material from the EU because it's too dirty due to Basel Convention laws. So then we t uh, took back um, 2,000 tons of our growing number. We started in 2022 of asparagus film, perforated films, um, something like six, 600 tons also growing. And then we returned uh, bale nets 
um, eight, almost 800 tons and baled twine almost 5, 500 tons. There the problem is that we have a, a, a collection system for household waste in Germany and this material have a very low volume. No? So that means some farmers just throw it in the yellow bin in Germany so it's not easy to get this material back into the system. But we are working on it also together with the co um, municipalities to get more material of this into our, our collection system. Um, we also did some pilots um, with, with the other uh, uh, collection groups. Um, for example, mulching films, we, we um, collected and recycled um, 121 tons um, in the last year. Uh, there, we, we talked a lot about uh, the problems yesterday. Um, it is still very difficult to recycle and I think um, for the recycler, they can only take it in, in, uh, in, in small amounts also in Europe. So there's, a, there's no, um, in, no good solution for recycling material recycling uh, inside in the moment. Then we, we are now starting with greenhouse film and getting all the members on board. Um, this is an easy recy to recycle film. We did a, a trip tape pilot, a pilot project I collected 40 tons last year together with Netafim, so very proud. We will now broaden that to, 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 uh, to um, the, the whole country and uh, also together with other producers in Erde, so we will have uh, more quantities there. And we also collected Hailnet, which is only in, in a small region in Germany where they grow, uh, grow apples in the south, in Lake Constance. We collected uh, 50 tons last year. And then we did an R&D project. Um, so t it was uh, together with the Leibniz Institute, a fam famous institute in Germany, and the uh, machinery company Hermler, which is working a lot for, for asparagus farmers. And it, it was a machine uh, to support the development um, um, in order to, uh, or it was a, ma a machine uh, for the cutting uh, of the asparagus sand pockets um, of the film. So in, in the asparagus film you have a film and on the side you have sand pockets and that these pockets are filled with sand, sometimes also with a little bit of soil. <laughs> and um, so the contamination levels are very high of this film. So we, um, we uh, invented uh, this, this, this uh, machine in order to cut these sand pockets and then to empty the sand pockets and to clean the film. Yeah. And the results were quite promising. So there is already a prototype on the market, already sold to, to farmers in uh, southern Germany. And um, we got to, the, to a, a mass reduction over uh, 20, uh, 75%. And um, we got uh, to a cleaning um, of 94.2%, which is quite well um, and saves a lot of uh, money for the farmers. Um, and the good thing is that the, the machine is mobile, so you can, um, you can put them from farm to farm. So that means um, we have, in, in southern Germany, we have, um, I think it's 10, 10 to 12 um, asparagus farmers that share the machine, and they bring it from farm to farm in order to clean, in, to clean their films, and then they can be sent to recycling. To recycle films with sand pockets is um, the same as recycling mulching film. You have more soil and earth and contamination or um, soilage than plastics, and it's very difficult. How does Erde work? So we have, um, first of all, we have in the middle, we have an association. This is the association of the film producers or plastic producers. They do all the political work and advocacy. Then we have us as a system operator. We, we, um, we organize all the collection and do all the marketing and communication stuff and also the documentation of the um, collected amounts. And then we have uh, a third party, a trustee, who's doing all the stuff concerning compliance and collection of uh, quantities from the members. You can imagine we have, um, in, for example, in the silage area, we have more than 90% uh, of the companies or the volume um, uh, that is sold in Germany, so we need a third party that takes, takes care of, of the quantities announcement of the members. So then we have a general assembly two times a year, and we have an advisory board. In this advisory board, there is the federal and uh, regional ministries for environment and agriculture. So we, have, um, uh, we are quite happy uh, because they help us with communication. 
they also um, are a critical voice um, to, to the system. Um, this is very helpful. And we also have some NGOs there, so um, it's good to exchange with all the stakeholders around. How does it work from the financing uh, point? So the members are paying a, a fee per ton. So members are the film producers, for example, that bring the film into the market. And this gives the annual budget of ERDE. And um, this is sent via the trustee to, to RGK. And then we found the marketing um, of the system. We found the administration costs for us and IK, the association. And of course, the <coughs> two thirds of the money is going back to the collection point. The collection point receives an incentive per ton of um, collected material. Um, if this material is going to, to um, uh, material recycling, and so he can give, um, and, he, and he also decides, so the collection points decides also what price he charges from the farmer. So it's a very liberal, market-oriented system. And for the farmer, this also means that he can uh, uh, give back the film very cost-efficiently. And um, we can see this on our figures, so 70% is coming, coming back um, from the market, so it's used quite well by the, farm, uh, by the farmers uh, in Germany. Um, so this is the, the good thing is it's not only a model for Germany. It could, uh, we could also uh, implement Erde now in Switzerland for two years, and we are now looking to to go to Austria. So it's not the same. Um, you have to adapt it. Also, the structure is differently, but it works from the principle of the liberal market system. It works also in, in, in Switzerland. There we we founded the system in 2021. We have now 20 members. Not only film producers here, we have also um, dealers, because in, in Switzerland there's no film producing company, so the dealers are on board in the system. We have also one recycler there, and um, also the Swiss Contractor Association, which is the association of the farmers um, and contractors, both are on board. There we um, uh, have also a collection network of 110 collection points at the moment. Um, everywhere in Switzerland, most of them are, are stationary collection points and um, also um, like in Germany they are coming from the distributors, from the machinery rings, contractors and also disposal and recycling companies. What did we collect there? So the market is much smaller in Switzerland, it's around 6,000 tons and we collected 2,100 uh, last year of uh, silage film and stretch film and 110 tons of bale net. And now we will also add um, twine, baler twine, to the, to the system. And we are awaiting an expansion of the collection network in the western part of Switzerland, in the French-speaking part. Yeah, so to sum up, um, what are the main benefits of this system? So AIRD offers a, a, <clears throat> a close-by cost-effective infrastructure um, for the farmers to bring back their films and their agricultural plastics. We are a market-based system. That means we uh, also included, this is very important in Germany, before Erde there were, were already uh, a collection of agricultural plastics in place. And through our incentive system, we could um, integrate these existing systems into, uh, into Erde. Um, and this worked quite well. Yeah? So it's the market-based system that works with incentives and not with a full cost approach. Um, so this also allows, that's not uh, on full cost, to have lower uh, disposal costs for the farmers while still in incentivizing a pre-cleaning uh, process. That means if the farmer can give back his film for free, he has no incentive to clean the dirt from the film. No? So this is quite, quite okay to pay a little for at the collection point. And of course, and this is a, a topic that is coming more and more, we increase um, the supply of recyclates on the market. Um, a lot of film producers, especially in the, in the silage film production, um, but also in the asparagus film production, use recyclates from our system. So um, the, the, the loop is already closed, and um, we want to increase this um, and also the quality of our recyclates in the future. And of course, we have all the data and we have a, a, a very high transparency of, of all the agri-waste streams in Germany and Switzerland. 
So uh, thank you much for your attention. Um, if you are interested in the European perspective of plastics recycling, we have also a conference. Um, we are partnering with, with uh, Jean on that point, which is in, uh, in December in Wiesbaden. So um, be happy to see you there. And um, if you have any questions, I'm there. <laughs> No questions. So beyond the collection no. points, how are you guys working to build infrastructure around the processing of the materials in, in Europe as well? Or are you guys relying on export markets to kind of handle a lot of material? You know, we are, we are happy to have a quite good infrastructure in Europe. So we are working together with some, mm -hmm. uh, or with, with European recyclers, with several European recyclers. And we have um, a contract with them in order that they can rely on, on constant supply from us. So they are able to invest in long term. Um, uh, they are able to invest uh, long term. So they have a good uh, long term perspective uh, on the supply side, which helps a lot uh, in the end. Yeah. But we are working mainly on a contractual basis with them. Yeah. I have a question. Jan, what mm -hmm. advice would you have for us here in the US to? maybe replicate what you're doing there, especially when it comes to policy and opportunities so that to incentivize recycling, because right now I, I'm trying to apply these concepts to the farmers I work with, and I mean, they're not required to recycle, so it's just more good faith effort. What I know you know a lot about recycling here too. What advice do you have? Mm -hmm. So uh, to, uh, to be honest, the thing is that um, in Europe, we do, uh, we do not have legislation on agricultural plastics apart from packaging either. So there's no legislation behind that, that system, that added system. The others, yes. Pesticide packaging, we have legislation. Uh, industrial packaging, we have legislation. Um, and, uh, um, agricultural plastics, not. But, of course, we have a very high costs um, for incineration. We have no landfills anymore in Germany for plastics. This is one thing, but we have high cost of incineration. So, of course, there's also an economic incentive to go to the recycling facility because it's a little bit, it's cheaper, much cheaper than, than the incineration. Yeah? So there is already, and this is a, it's a factor. On the other hand, you need to do a lot of communication. This is for sure. Yeah? You see how, how our crafts were, like such a little, and then growing, growing, growing. Ten years is uh, not very short period. Yeah? So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, the, the, the constant communication and um, convincing of, of the farmers. And of course, there has to be another incentive, otherwise the farmer is very cost sen sensitive, which we all can understand, um, in order to, to make it happen. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, the system is not, not very expensive. So the, the, the eco fee we are, tell, uh, we are talking about here is 40 euros a ton. Yeah? This is not much. So this is, I would say, uh, very cheap. In the packaging sector, we have much, much higher, much higher costs. Okay. What is the typical cost of um, the asparagus uh, equipment and machinery to clean that up? Um, I think the, uh, this machinery is around, I think, eighty thousand euros or something like this. It's not not very cheap, so. This is why a lot of uh, so some farmers uh, shared it, yeah. And it's there's only in the moment there's one uh, machinery on the market, but when there will be some scales, ho hopefully some economies of scale, if uh, there are more more market, uh, machineries on the market. Yeah. Could you speak in a little more detail about the cleaning process? You talked about sand pockets. Mm -hmm. Could you go into a little more mm -hmm. detail about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the machine is built like this. So you have, you have first of all, in the asparagus um, film, you have the film, and then on the side you have sand pockets, and these, or they, you have pockets out of plastic, and these pockets are filled with sand, that uh, it's not f uh, flying away, you know, because you have this this dam, and then, then uh, the the film on it, and the machine um, is 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 uh, has a wheel that is cutting the sand pockets. Uh, and the wheel is turning around, so the, the knife is not used so much because um, if you use just a, a knife to cut it, 
you will lose the, the knife immediately because you have the mixture of sand and mud, which is very abrasive. Um, and so they used a kind of wheel to cut holes into the sand pockets. And then they use a lot of vibration yeah, in order to get the sand falling out. Yeah. And, and you, then you get the sand pockets empty, but you also clean the film on the surface. Yeah, that's the, that's the, more or less the process. I could send you a video, but you know, uh, I didn't show it here. It uh, would sometimes it works, sometimes it's not. But I could show you a video also of the machine. It's on, on YouTube, where you see more details. Maybe. <clears throat> Jan, uh, Wiesbaden, Germany, uh, beginning of December, you're already going to have the Christmas markets with Bratwurst and warm wine, right? Right. Okay, right. just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Another reason to go. <laughs> That's right. There's a Christmas market during this time in Wiesbaden. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you. forget the Klo wine. Glühwein. <laughs> awesome. Are there any more questions? And if you, if you wouldn't mind, when you're asking a question, do you mind just introducing yourself in the organization that you're representing, just for future questions? Oh. Awesome. If, if you don't mind when you're asking questions, just uh, introduce your name and the organization that you're representing. Um, if there's no more questions for Jan, we can go ahead to the next presentation. Thank you. Okay. One more round of applause for Jan. Oh, no, you can. Um, the next presentation is going to be Collecting and Recycling Ag Plastics in Canada with Barry Friesen, the Executive Director of Clean Farms. Thank you very much, and uh, and thank you to Jean and Dana for uh, for having us once again. Uh, give you an overview of what we're doing, and uh, um, and uh, thank you all. And it was a great presentation so far. Um, what I'm going to talk about is similar to somewhat similar to what Jan has just said, and and uh, some of the things that we're doing uh, in Canada on egg plastics. And uh, let me see how this works. I just, yeah. Good, good. OK, yeah, tech is working. Um, and I'm Barry Friesen. I'm the executive director of Clean Farms. And I've been there 15 years ago. Uh, 15, years. Uh, 15 years ago in May, I was hired. It was just me. And if we fast forward to today, uh, we have almost 25 staff uh, across Canada. Uh, we've got head offices in, in Toronto, and then everybody else works out of their home because we need people close to where the agriculture is. And, uh, and again, from Alberta all the way to Nova Scotia. Uh, we, haven't, uh, we do operations in British Columbia, but uh, not enough to warrant a permanent staff member that will be coming. We do have consultants that uh, do work for us there. We are the, and, and as we pre presented in past uh, presentations here, uh, that uh, are, we're a nonprofit industry stewardship organization. Uh, we're the Canadian leader in this. And uh, we have, uh, we used to, up until a year and a half ago, have a slide that looked like this with all of our members. Um, now we've got way too many. There's over 200 members because of some of the new programs we have. But I just wanted to show that we've grown quite a bit. When I started, 15 years ago, we, we started uh, and launched with about, you know, just over 20 members, and now here we are today with over 200. Of course, we're doing a whole lot more different product, products today. Um, what I'll talk about is ag plastics generation in Canada. I was, I was very pleased to see the U.S. Uh, uh, doing it uh, earlier this morning and, uh, and you know, sort of matching our, our numbers with their numbers and whatnot. Uh, talk about our core and pilot program and issues in transition from voluntary to permanent. Um, some strategic communications is an interesting one that we did and uh, some voluntary versus mandatory programming in the future. Um, starting with, if you don't know where you are, you're not liable to get to where you want to be. And so we did the uh, waste characterization. This was a, uh, an extensive study and I won't go into the detail uh, on it, other than the fact that uh, a couple of key points. Uh, we've estimated 62,000 tons of ag plastics being generated every year in Canada. 
This is probably a very low estimate. I would not be surprised if it ends up to be double that by the time we're, we're you know, we, we realize all the, all the uh, realities around ag plastics, and of course, uh, ag plastics are growing too in use. Uh, a little bit difference from what we heard earlier this morning is that um, our pots and trays in the greenhouse side of things is only those that would stay on the ground at the farm. They do not include pots and trays that go to the consumer. And, uh, but for the most part, and, and of course, uh, we do have, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse uh, industries uh, dominated in British Columbia and in Ontario, and uh, uh, not, uh, there, there is some across the entire country, but uh, that's where the, the majority of it, it is located, not nearly as much as in some of the southern climes. And as you can see, uh, for the dairy industry and beef industry, uh, the orange on the top represents uh, most of what's generated on, uh, uh, on the beef farms and the dairies and the ranches. And, uh, and so that, uh, that, that's a good portion of the, the work that we do. Uh, and we also, and I was pleased to see that they included in the U.S. the maple syrup tubing. It's, uh, it's, it's a small component, but very, very interesting. But the, the positive thing about that one is it, uh, um, it's a lot easier to manage uh, because, you know, it's set number of growers and they're very, very well organized. Maple syrup, um, Canada uh, dominates the world in maple syrup production, 70% uh, of it. Uh, there's uh, uh, the next biggest piece is, I, I believe, out of Vermont, probably, and, uh, and then, of course, Germany. And I think that's uh, where all the maple syrup comes from. Um, a bit of our trajectory from, uh, from before my time, uh, there was a, con a pesticide container recycling program or collection program. It began in 1989 in, in Canada. It was, uh, there was actually some some other programs before 1989 uh, operated by uh, government, and then industry took it over in 1989. Uh, they managed up until uh, 2010 on their own, um, kind of operating on the side of the desk. They did pesticide containers of 23 liters and smaller. And, uh, you know, dominated by the, the 10 liter container, the two and a half gallon container. And uh, uh, they added obsolete pesticides in 1998 uh, and uh, and some pesticide bags in one small province in Canada in 2006 and then when I started in 2009 I was hired to to incorporate the company and start up and go forth and multiply and so you can see the trajectory we, we kept adding programs fertilizer containers in 2013 reality was they were already in the collection program they just weren't paying their way and uh, and so we uh, we got them on board we said okay you guys ha now have to pay for this as well and the best thing for you to do is pay us now or you'll be regulated into it later and it'll be a lot more expensive and so so they did and uh, and we did get more and and we continue to the market continues to evolve and so ensuring that we get all of the uh, players into it. Uh, that's one of our flagships, earlier ones. We started bulk pesticide containers all the way up to 1,000 liter IBCs uh, in 2015, and so that also is operated. Uh, interesting fact, of the pesticides delivered in Canada, 35% of them are delivered in deposit containers, uh, multi-use uh, refillables, and uh, of the product, uh, of the liquid product, 35% is in the reuse side of things. We don't currently manage those containers, although we usually manage them once they come out of service. So the members, uh, dominated by two players, uh, Bayer and BSF, which has the, the larger share of the market for reusable containers. Um, seed bags started in the east uh, in 2016 and now has spread across the country. I think uh, we still are not collecting in British Columbia, but that will be soon and uh, bulk fertilizer containers in 2018, seed and pesticide bag pilots in the West, and then went permanent. Um, and uh, they're on, and the difference today from what was before, I'll, I'll get into some of these details. Uh, a lot has to do with, we have our core programs or voluntary ones, which was the pesticide and fertilizer industry. We're happy to come on board and pay for our programs and for us to strive for 100% collections. We're not there yet, but we're getting pretty close. Uh, 
Um, but uh, the rest of the products really need to have uh, a backstop regulation to make it happen, and that's the EPR regulations. Um, this gives a little idea of some of the products that we, we manage from uh, bale and silage wrap. Um, the um, containers, both small and large, twine, typically we connect, uh, collect them in large bags, um, grain bags, um, and, and, uh, and silage bags, and uh, everything else, and uh, as well as the obsolete pesticides and animal health products. Those are not recycled, those are sent for high, high temperature incineration. Um, our pilot programs are help us substantively in, in moving forward. I think, you know, some people say a pilot program is nothing more than a two-year delay on, on a permanent program, but we need to gather data. We need to figure out what works and what doesn't. So there is all, always some things that uh, sound good on paper but don't work in, in real life. We have to work with the farmers and what's going to suit them so that they can participate and figure out with the collection sites what works and what doesn't and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, every program that we've had, we started it as a pilot and then we've transitioned it into a permanent. We still have some pilots that are going on. Again, some are delays and uh, some, the delay is usually on behalf of the government because if, uh, if a permanent program requires an EPR regulation, we have to wait on them. We're running a, a fairly substantive grain bag and twine collection pilot in the, the province of Alberta. It's our largest beef producing uh, province, and uh, uh, they would like to have a permanent program, but it's really, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, it's a very, con it's a conservative government, and they, they're very, very cautious about putting new regulations. The reality is, this will be new cost to a farmer. They'll have to absorb it, because currently the program is being paid for by government, either municipal or provincial or both uh, taxes. Some of the pro pilot programs ha have resulted in the development of new equipment. I, I don't have a picture here, but for instance, the grain bag collection program, they've developed a special roller. It's relatively simple, but the uh, farmer driven uh, invention that uh, you know, was used to, to roll up the grain bags. Uh, grain bags are used, uh, they're single use. Uh, they're destroyed once they're emptied. They're emptied all at once, and so it's a lot of plastic. Uh, grain bags typically, you know, uh, they run from 200 feet long to 500 feet long. 250 to 300 is the, the, probably the typical one, and they uh, will weigh up to 100, uh, or over 150 kilograms a piece. So it's a lot of plastic. One person cannot pick those up, and so they had to develop special machinery to roll it up. Uh, there's several uh, grain bag rollers on the market uh, in, in the prairies, primarily used in the prairies and uh, a very good thing. Another thing that was developed is uh, a very low-cost baler. Um, Commercial balers, usually downstroke balers, are, work very well for a lot of the film products uh, on the farm. The trouble is that they're expensive. Uh, you know, a farmer, uh, you know, off the shelf, ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars a piece. They can get this particular one. This is a sort of a higher end one, made with uh, a combination of steel and recycled plastic lumber by a, a manufacturer out of Alberta, and it's a down, you know, more of a manual downstroke baler. Very, very effective. Um, dairy farms in Canada, typically not that large. The average size of a herd is 90 in Canada. Uh, dairy um, is supply managed in Canada, so as a result, they've, they've, they've saved the small family farm. Uh, dairy farm, although milk is very expensive in Canada compa compared to elsewhere. But uh, um, as a result, a 90 herd uh, farm may only have three bales of uh, bale wrap per year. It's really not that much, and so it's it's hard to justify an investment of 20 grand just for you know three bales of of uh, bale wrap every year. But it's very very effective. They can get one of these. This one will retail from 2,000 to 2,500 dollars. Is one they can build themselves out of old pallets for uh, under a thousand dollars. Our early indicators, this isn't a great slide other than it shows some of the research we did in the last four years on, on some of the pilot programs we were running. 
Uh, this was particular data out of BC, uh, where, where it's uh, not our largest dairy uh, province, but uh, they do have a fairly heavy uh, in, in various pockets of a lot of dairy farms, and some of the larger ones too. There, there is one farm uh, with a thousand herd, uh, and the indications are that uh, from 2020 to 2023, the, the research we did in, in this pilot program showed that there was some behavioral changes uh, with the farmer, a lot less going to landfill. Uh, the burning side of things, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, burning is illegal of plastics in, in across the country in Canada, uh, but it still occurs. And the, the old adage, you don't see black smoke at night. And uh, <laughs> um, so there you go. Um, so uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is transitioning pilot to full-time EPR programs. It is a challenge. Uh, uh, you know, one of the key things is we won't do anything, uh, you know, unless we have a secured funding source, either through an e a regulation, government regulation that makes it happen, or for the, for the pesticide and seed industry, they voluntarily came forward and, and said we're not going to wait for the regulation we need to do this and we need to do it now and so they they, they agreed that they would pay for it and so we secure the funding uh, we need to uh, and for things on the regulated side of things you might think that it's easy but it's not because uh, you know a regulation may be out there but uh, the stewards that uh, those that are obligated to participate in the program they will try and find any loophole and anything under under the sun to, to get around it uh, our most recent one was in Quebec and uh, um, and in that program the um, you know we set a date this is when the fees start and there's a lot of sales the day before the fees started on the program so and uh, and uh, surprisingly a lot of them had very full warehouses that were purchased before uh, the, the the actual date so um, whether that's true or not um, we do audits on on them so but it, uh, the startup is always a challenge um, and then you have to communicate uh, the key program uh, program components you can't just build it and they will come You've got to communicate it to the farmers, uh, identify what's going on. And that's the power of a pilot program is because they start to get used to this. They hear communications through their associations and whatnot. And, uh, and you know, there, there's a desire. There's always the early adopters, and then there's the middle, mushy middle, and then there's the, the really hard-nosed ones, and those are the pro probably the ones that are still burning their material, even if it's illegal. Um, we also have done a, a huge transition, and I'm not going to go into the gory details on this, on our container program, but this just shows you, and this is one of the nicer pictures, a nicer collection site for uh, small pesticide containers on, on the left-hand side of things. This was outdoors. Looks not bad. I've got some really nasty photos of some that, uh, that looked really, really bad, you know, and with the, uh, about 2 to 3 percent of the containers, a seed treat containers I think Jan talked about it uh, the the challenge with seed treatment and uh, it's heavily dyed and it can really color everything and when you and when you're outdoors um, you can have some pretty nasty looking uh, sites as well as it. this one looks pretty clean because I didn't want to show you the, na the nastiest one but the reality is we've gone transition now and we're in the last year of a transition in two large provinces in the prairies that are going to a uh, bag-based collection system for all of the containers it um, you know it adds so many positive elements uh, uh, a lot of our contractors have a no touch system so nobody uh, physically touches a pesticide container uh, it's collected in a bag so the uh, the driver throws this onto the truck or, or they use a grapple to pick it up and put it in the truck and then it goes from there into a uh, shredder um, and either a baler sometimes and then into a bale shredder or directly into the shredder so there's a lot uh, um, of benefit on this so we've, we've made some extreme uh, benefits to both the farmers and the retailers that were originally collecting these communications incredibly important these are a little bit wordy here but uh, uh, they need to be consistent comprehensive 
and uh, constant communication to the farmers. It's easy for people to forget about the program, even though they've been doing it for years. And the, uh, we also operate en Francais. So uh, our, we have one French province and we have one bilingual province, and, uh, but we, we have an offering and we have staff, uh, almost a third of our staff are bilingual, uh, French and English, and, uh, and so we, we do both and uh, really, really important. It, we also operate under a French brand name in, in the, the one unilingual French province, Quebec, Agri Recoup, and uh, very, very important f for opening doors and, and acceptance into the program. Nothing worse than going into a province where they all speak French and we, we're, I'm only speaking English, so it's really important to do it in their native tongue. I wanted to do, uh, you know, almost to the end here, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's driving our communications. And uh, we've partnered with a company called Tactics. And uh, they're a GR firm, they've done work all over the world. Uh, particularly Europe, and uh, they're based in Canada, and uh, they do what w they call uh, deep learning. And this was a really interesting one because, and you can hear all, all kinds of research and horror stories about, I did a survey of people and they said they, they wanted to recycle. I did a survey and they said, we were happy to pay more to recycle my uh, product. Uh, you know, just a marginal extra cost. You put it to market, it never happens. Yeah, I want to do a lot of things. You know, I want to win a million dollars. I want to, yeah, is it going to happen? <laughs> Who knows? And uh, uh, people will lie on those things. I, I guess I do want to win a million dollars. I'm not lying there, but uh, likely not to happen. But a lot of the things that I, I will do in the marketplace, people vote with their wallets. They go to the grocery store, they go to the department store, and if something is a little bit cheaper, you know, I did say on that survey that I would pay more for a recycled package, but you know what, this one is you know, 20% off the other one, so I'm gonna buy that. So surveys are difficult. Now what isn't, uh, dif uh, they're difficult because people lie, and, uh, or what they desire and what they actually do could be two totally different things. But what doesn't lie are Google searches. And, uh, and your internet usage, it doesn't lie. You know, what sites you visit, what you will do, what conversations you're having on Facebook, on, on Instagram, and all these things. Tactics have uh, tapped into the system. It's, it's um, I, I can't say it's controversial, but uh, it, the reality is people are watching what you, what you search for. And they're able to do, listen in on what people are talking about in issues of interest. Not what they think we want them to say when, when we ask, but what, what they're actually talking about. They're not being pressured into this. This is what they're talking about. And we tested through this system several types of messages. And what I really wanted to leave with you folks is what are the messages that we originally, you know, I mentioned the fact that, you know, sometimes our biggest competitor is the Bic lighter, you know, and, and a can of diesel. Um, and, um, the, the and we thought okay if we explain to the farmers you know how bad burning is and you know you shouldn't be doing it you know you got to shoo the kids away you might reach a few of them but at the end of the day if it's something that their behavior is that it's easy to do and they'll continue to do it um, and in fact the research showed that if we actually talked about burning we'd get a negative result out of this we'd probably get more burning farmers also don't like to be told what to do and, uh, you know, I know how to farm. Um, you know, you're not going to come from the city and tell me how to do things. What mattered the most to them, and you can see these in, is aesthetics of the farm, the convenient and easy way that you can participate in the program, and the alignment of values. Farmers like to be like their neighboring farmers. They like to be seen as good stewards, as good people, um, uh, salt of the earth, and, uh, and the number one thing, of course, aesthetics on the farm. Really matches with our brand, Clean Farms. A clean farm is a good farm, and, uh, and so we've been uh, targeting our advertising and our communications towards that behavior uh, so that the farmers um, like this. We've, we've stopped the, the negative advertising, don't do this, don't do that. You know, 
talking about as much as we'd like to. You know, as much as I'd like to see a few of them that are burning uh, get a, a big bad ticket and have to pay for it, that really will probably backfire if we, if we advertised that and did it. So, um, and the other thing that uh, I haven't shown on here, and you'll see the advertisement on the far right, and that's a female driving the tractor. And uh, one of the things that really came out of the research, and, and we, I've known this in the recycling business before clean farms, is that <coughs> on the household level, it's the uh, uh, essentially the mother that's driving the behaviors. You know, she may not be taking the garbage out or the recycling out, but she's telling the kids and the husband to do it, and she's driving that behavior. And we're seeing the same thing on the farm, and uh, so we. Uh, um, our, a lot of our advertising is, uh, you know, mul uh, you know, multi-gender. So uh, driving the, the female on the farm, that is, uh, you know, looking after the farm for the future generations. So I just really wanted to uh, highlight the power of this particular research and uh, and how we, we can start to develop, uh, you know, get away from those traditional surveys. We still do them, but um, but they're questionable at times. Um, uh, almost to the end here, uh, we originally had our voluntary and uh, mandatory program, is that populating? Oh, sorry, I didn't know this was, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, what I really wanted to highlight here is the fact that, oh, I think there's one more coming on, is that the original ones we were running our, our container program, small and large, and, and the bag program voluntarily. Uh, as EPR regulation comes in, and EPR regulation is a big thing in Canada, on the consumer side of things, almost everything is captured under that, and it's now being captured under um, EPR for agriculture. We're braced for it, we're ready for it, and, uh, and we have four provinces now with EPR regulations, and they're, and they're also starting to grow. Quebec being our largest province, uh, the second largest province in Canada, and the largest one with virtually everything but the kitchen sink in, in the regulation. Um, uh, the future of ag plastic stewardship in Canada, uh, we're bracing for EPR in every province. New uh, labeling and recycling content laws are on the horizon at a federal level. Uh, there's a federal plastics registry in place and agriculture are going to have to report into that. So every piece of plastic that uh, comes into Canada <coughs> from agriculture or developed, uh, you know, formed, every plastic manufactured item has to be accounted for by 2026 and uh, for the 2025 year. And uh, companies produce uh, technical solutions. Uh, um, we are working hard on things like bottle-to-bottle -bottle recycling and whatnot. And uh, so there's a lot of change to come in the next future. And I'll leave it at that. Happy to answer any questions. I guess just a few. We only have, what, four minutes? Yeah. Um, so we have seven minutes if there's any, if there's any questions. It looks like Brad in the front. So on each of the... Uh, different products that you recycle just help me clarify the, the, uh, industry partners are the ones who actually yeah pay it's, for that recycling service yeah and it, it does get challenging because it's often the the what they label as the first importer into a region so the um, you know let's take the Quebec region uh, it's uh, um, the first importer of that particular twine or or bale and silage wrap that so it's often the dealer themselves that are paying the fees. Okay. And I'd like to see the brand owner itself of the original, but uh, the one but who manufactured the, the provincial the, the provincial regulations are the, their, their borders is, is as far as they can go from a legal perspective. And just a reminder, if you wouldn't just mind introducing yourself before you ask a question. Hello, this is Rene from Driscoll's in Mexico. Um, you mentioned about the several challenges and the how are you related with these 200 companies in, in this relationship. So my question is um, if you can provide us some of the 
good practices working with this big number of companies with a non-profit. Sorry, the question is, what do we... So the good practices. What are the good... Yeah. Uh, us as the non-profit? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact we're a non-profit is, you know, it's partly a legal requirement as well as it, it, it made for good practice for us. Uh, I, I look at um, Jan from Germany. They are a for-profit organization. Uh, Unfortunately, that wouldn't fly for some of the new EPR regulations in, in Canada. They, they actually require if you're going to operate a program, you have to be uh, a not-for-profit. So, so that gets that out of the table. But in terms of how we operate, we're almost very, very, very similar to all the other EPR organizations, whether for-profit or not-for-profit. Most of them in the EPR are not-for-profit. It doesn't mean that we're, ch we're not charities. You know, they do pay me, and uh, you know, and we have uh, fairly good uh, structures to s uh, set up. And uh, it just so happens. Uh, let's take barcodes for instance. The the people that provide barcodes in North America is a not-for-profit organization, and uh, you know, they're they're very corporate. They're, they're they're shareholders. They're owners. Our owners are the 200 members, and uh, and so to work with us, uh, you know, we. You know, we have a set of rules on, uh, for everybody that uh, is obligated to pay into a program. There's, there's a set of rules. Uh, we try and make it as easy as possible. Um, easy is always good, but it's just, um, it, it's, there's a lot in there, but we try and, we try and operate as corporate as, as possible just under the not-for-profit rules. I hope that answers. It, it's a bit of a loaded question and uh, but it, it, because, you know, there's always challenges, but it, the, the not-for-profit status never becomes a pro problem for us. Barry, let me ask Gene Jones, Southern Waste Exchange, quick question for you because you talked about the burning of plastics, right? Yeah. So I'm from Florida. It happens a lot in Florida because yeah. we've got an exemption in our Solid Waste Act that allows the farmers to burn in place at the end of the growing season. So I'm curious to know whether you know of any research, and this can go to everybody in this room, is there any research that has been conducted on the burning of agricultural plastics and the potential effect to human health and the environment? Well, we have done, you know, when I, in the early days when, when I started, uh, I did uh, a couple of research projects on, you know, how many dioxins, furons, and, and whatnot when you open burn these materials. So there, there is research, and I could help uh, uh, bring it to you. It, the FAO, which is producing a, a, a voluntary code of conduct for ag plastics, uh, it's in development right now. Um, you know, they talk about open burning is a bad thing, but uh, the, the, the trouble is, is try and explain dioxins and furons to, to a farmer. And uh, um, they said, well, I've been doing it for years. It's, but happy Theron, to help. Ron, you had your hand up. Okay. Jan had just mentioned it, and I was just curious. Uh, Jan said there's no landfills in Europe that accept uh, pl ag plastics anymore. Is that the same th case in Canada? Is that part of the reason why the success of this adaptation? Yeah, it, it actually, um, uh, you know, we still have landfills, and, and it is a bit of a challenge in some of the, particularly the prairie provinces where the landfills are still relatively cheap. Uh, most of them are, you know, uh, well over $100 a ton to dispose of uh, in a landfill, and uh, uh, so that, that has driven part of it. Um, uh, for instance, in the province I live in, in Ontario, there's one farmer that was collecting bale and silage wrap, and uh, for about a decade, had this massive pile and uh, is under orders from the ministry to clean it up. And their worry was, well, if we put this in the landfill, the landfill is done in our local community. So, so that was, uh, so they've, they've been very, very patient about, if, A, it has to come off the field, but B, uh, let's, let's be careful and let's get it through a recycling stream. Uh, they have recently told me, is that we don't care where it goes as long as it's not in our landfill. And, I'm not sure if that was the right answer, but. Awesome. One more big thank you to, to Barry.
Um, next, we have Mark Hudson, the executive director of the Ag, Contain Ag Container Recycling Council, Council, which has been alluded to in a number of these, these presentations, and he'll be presenting on Ag Container Recycling Council program update. Great. Thank you, Sam. Thank you again to Gene and APRC for allowing us to present here. I'll uh, reiterate the public service announcement from earlier. For those that have been hanging towards the back of the room, I've counted at least 15 plus seats up in the front two rows. I know a lot of people like to sit in the back, but if you want to move forward, you won't bother me a bit. So feel free to take this opportunity to move up if you want to be able to see better or be closer. Um, <clears throat> thank you all again. And uh, as, as Sam just mentioned, I uh, want to share with you a, an update on the ACRC program or the Ag Container Recycling Council program today. Um, <clears throat> three, three kind of key areas that I want to cover. Uh, one is just an overview of who we are, similar to what both Jan and Barry have just done. Um, I know that there are at least probably half of the folks in the room that may not have been um, at the last one of these or be, may not be familiar with our program. Um, I'll then give an update on some of the key initiatives that we're working on, uh, some related to our strategic plans, um, and then also talk about packaging legislation. Um, you've heard the words uh, or the, the uh, acronym EPR mentioned a number of times uh, already this morning. Uh, so I'm going to touch on that relative to U.S. And, and what we're seeing and how that affects um, our program. Uh, my goal today is, is really to update uh, all of you who are familiar with our program, uh, inform those of you who are not, and, and uh, where possible, maybe provide some education. So um, we'll also have opportunity for question and answer uh, when we get to the end. Um, <clears throat> just a little background about the ACRC program. Uh, kind of very similar to Jan and to, to Barry's programs uh, in Germany and in Canada. The ACRC program has now been in place for over 30 years. We were also uh, founded back in 1992 um, also as a not-for-profit. Uh, we are a 501c6, which is a trade association. And as far as we know, we're the oldest such stewardship program in the United States. Um, since day one, we've been involved with uh, providing research, uh, funding for research uh, around uh, the recycling of the containers that we collect. In fact, originally we were fun founded as the Ag Container Research Council. Um, so that kind of gives you a, a sense for really the core of uh, and the spirit of the member companies that founded our program. Um, we've also been involved with the promotion and education around uh, triple rinsing and pressure rinsing of containers. Uh, which is fundamental to what we do. Uh, we've been working on that in collaboration with uh, EPA and then also with a couple of standards organizations, ANSI and ASABI, uh, to create our own standard called the ANSI ASABI S596 standard. You can think about that as sort of like ISO 9000 for um, the recycling of, of ag containers. <clears throat> um, in terms of kind of what our miss mission is, uh, as some of the points that I just made, but we, we've been involved with research uh, all along the way. Um, I have with me this morning uh, one of my colleagues, Lee O'Neill, who is our recycling end use manager, and that's a core part of her job is helping us with the research of acceptable end uses for the plastic that we collect. Um, we also are, uh, you know, the fundamental of, of our program is the collection program and the recycling of those containers, make sure that. Uh, those are performed in a cost-effective manner. And then we do a lot in the area of promotion. Uh, just conferences like this one, uh, we are involved with um, trade shows and industry conferences all across the country throughout the year um, that promote the program, uh, both at the grower level, but then also uh, with state agency folks and industry stakeholders, um, really at all levels of the, of the channel. Uh, in terms of the scope of our program, ours is uh, still much more focused on uh, agricultural chemicals. Uh, you heard from both Jan and, and Barry's programs, their scope is broader. It's, it's more all of ag plastics, whereas uh, our program was founded by uh, chemical companies and to this day remains 
Um, the, the members remain as chemical companies for the most part. And so uh, we are, are really focused on agricultural chemical containers, uh, but it's not just pesticides. That's uh, kind of the typical misconception is that we're only focused on pesticides. We're involved with really the whole universe of ag chemicals. So pesticides, fertilizers, animal health products, especially pest control, biologicals, adjuvants, and surfactants. Our goal is that a grower doesn't have to worry about uh, does this, this chemical apply or does this chemical apply? Really anything when they're cleaning up their farm of ag chemical plastics, um, everything is fair game. But uh, it's an industry funded program that's intended to benefit uh, growers and commercial applicators. Um, just briefly so you know kind of how we're structured, um, we fall under the umbrella of um, the Crop Life America, which is originally, that, that was where kind of the, the program started through the pesticide manufacturers, but has now grown to be expanded to all the diff other types of ag chemical programs that uh, I mentioned a moment ago. Um, but uh, we actually write a check every month to Crop Life America so that they can pay our, our salaries. We're basically on permanent contract assignment to run this program. They provide all of our back office support, um, but we have a close affiliation with Crop Life America. Uh, we're made up of 37 regular member companies uh, and uh, 17 affiliate members. Uh, we're actually uh, very soon, the next two weeks, we'll go to 38 regular member companies, which is a, a new development this week. Um, the regular member companies are the chemical manufacturers. They're the folks whose names are actually on the front of the container. And then the affiliate members are the packaging manufacturers. They're the folks that make the caps, the jugs, the drums, uh, the labels, etc. Um, in addition to Lee O'Neill and myself, we also have a, another staff member, uh, Sandy Jones, that supports us. Uh, so there's three on staff. You can see clearly I have a lot of uh, catching up to do to catch up to, uh, I think, 96 or whatever it was that Jan has and 25 that Barry has. But um, when I started six years ago, it was one, so I, I'm feeling um, much stronger with three now. <clears throat> Uh, this is uh, just a graphic of our member companies. I'm sure that uh, you'll recognize uh, many of these companies. A lot of them are large multinational uh, companies um, that uh, would be possibly folks that you're involved with. Uh, just the, the general process that's involved with uh, the containers, uh, very similar to the other programs that have been mentioned. Um, with ag containers, all of them have to be uh, triple rinsed, and so the, the farmer or the commercial applicator is responsible for rinsing of the containers. Uh, then they would store them until our contractors are able to arrive and, and collect them. Um, they collect in a couple of different fashions. Uh, some have mobile grinding uh, rigs, and then others have compactor trucks. Uh, essentially a glorified over-the-road garbage truck. Um, they will then inspect each container to make sure that it has been properly rinsed, um, and then they'll take it back to their facility, grind the plastic, and then ultimately uh, sell it for recycling. Um, <clears throat> these are a list of the approved end uses that our plastic is currently going into. Um, it's fundamental to kind of how we run the program is our contractors are only allowed to sell the plastic into end uses and to end user companies that we have approved. So it's a, a fairly prescriptive program in the sense that we try to make sure that we know where the plastic is, is going and uh, what it's being used for. Uh, so this is the current list. You can see um, right at the top, uh, we, we talked this morning about agricultural drain pipe and uh, I had saw uh, Daniel here. I don't know if there he is, he's still back there. So we got you top of the list there, Daniel. Um, but also we have uh, another one on his list, which is the underground uh, electrical conduit, and um, those are a couple of the key, key end uses that our program sells the plastic into. Uh, if you look at the history of our program, uh, I'm excited to be able to report at this uh, meeting that we have now officially eclipsed the uh, quarter of a billion pounds of plastic that has been collected and recycled uh, through this program over the last 32 years. Uh, so a pretty exciting milestone, uh, pretty impressive. You can see the last few years we've taken a dip that was a combination of both COVID and some structural uh, changes in terms of our cost structure around collection. Um, uh, we are expected to be back up to our pre-COVID collection levels this year, so we will at least eclipse the 11 million pound mark, and we have a budget that was to go over 13. We're probably not going to get that high, but um, definitely will be uh, above 11 million pounds, so it's exciting to see. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how we're doing that in just a moment. 
And then just some uh, sort of gee whiz statistics about uh, what that volume translates to. So again, um, you know, we've now gone in, in since the beginning of the year, we've gone to now over 250 million pounds of plastic. And uh, one that uh, Daniel, you'll appreciate there is in the top right corner. Um, that's enough six inch drain tile to circle the earth uh, almost three times. So that's a lot of drain pipe. Um, but you can also see how that translates into uh, CO2, um, greenhouse gas emissions, and also fuel savings. <clears throat> All right, I want to talk for a moment about uh, just updates on the program itself. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we have in our strategic plan, or our most recent strategic plan uh, prior to this year, was uh, the goal to achieve measurably uh, more credible collection performance nationwide with satisfied end users and, uh, and then also to develop better regional penetration through our contractor network. Uh, I'm happy this morning to have one of our, in fact, our largest contractor here in California, uh, Interstate Ag Plastics, Brad Biddleston, is, is here on the front row, so glad Brad can be with us again this year. But uh, our contractors are really the core of how we uh, achieve the numbers that I just shared with you. Uh, we have nine contractors across the country now that do the actual physical collection operations for us. And so one of the things that our goal over the last several years has been to try to strengthen that contractor network in a couple of key areas. We wanted to be able to improve customer service, if you, if you will, um, the collection lead times. Um, in certain geographies, we wanted to be able to have uh, deeper penetration in those regions to be able to collect more volume in specific states uh, or regions of states. And then uh, ultimately, we wanted to strengthen our contractor network um, to, to be prepared for the future because we know our goal is to grow the program. And so you can see in, in different regions of the country how we've done that. We've increased uh, in the southern U.S. A, a net increase of three new contractors, uh, three with smaller territories. We lost one, uh, but also increased one uh, larger territory. In California, we've added a second contractor. Um, and uh, we have a mix of, of sort of an approach there where Interstate Ag and the other contractors share some counties, some are dedicated counties, and the rest are all sole sourced counties. Um, in the East Coast, we added North Carolina to our Northeast contractor. Uh, exciting new development just in the last few months, we've added New Jersey, which was a state-run program, and so that, uh, that change just happened, I think, back in May. Um, we've had one contractor that has grown their territory, that's uh, G. Phillips in the Midwest, where we, we have expanded uh, that territory. So this is kind of what our footprint looks like today. Again, this is the core of how we make this program happen, is, is through our contractor network uh, here across the country. And you would find this uh, on our website, so any of you who um, have interest in stakeholders you work with being able to connect with our contractors, please uh, go to agrecycling.org. You'll find our, our, uh, our map there, and you'll also find it in our brochures uh, in the room next door. Another area that we've uh, been focusing on, uh, particularly in the last 18 months, is what I'll call our Clean Means Clean campaign. We've adopted a new slogan uh, called, uh, that says, clean means clean with no residue seen. What we are trying to do is find a way to articulate in a simple terms to the growers and applicators, what does it mean to have a clean container? And uh, that is, I can't stress enough how fundamental that is to the success of our program. If we have dirty containers, this program falls apart. And I could spend another hour just talking about the different layers of that. Um, but ultimately, they have to be triple or pressure rinsed, and that's driven by EPA. So EPA stipulates in, in regulations that I share there, 99.99% clean. And so what that means is that you can't have any residue. Um, and so ultimately, we came up with this slogan, which is sort of the black glove test. If you were to take a black rubber glove and rub it, rub it across the face of a jug or the inside of a jug, and you get you know, white residue or some colored residue that comes off, you know that that container is not clean. And so that's kind of the way we've uh, started to articulate this. Staining is one thing, that's fine, but uh, residue is not. And we've uh, built around that a, a lot of uh, improved uh, marketing literature, promotional literature, educational literature, um, such as our inspection checklist, our rinsing best practices. We've come up with a clean means clean poster um, that's waterproof, that can go out in the field, that helps uh, growers to communicate to, to their workers 
um, you know, really what, what the uh, standards look like. And ultimately the goal is that when our contractors arrive, they're not dealing with dirty plastic that has to be rejected. Just some changes that we're seeing in terms of the operating landscape today, um, and, and none of these probably will be a huge surprise to many of you. Just the worsening public perception around plastic and plastic waste in general is a huge issue, and we deal with that on a daily basis. Um, we're also seeing this explosion of packaging legislation. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, increased difficulty in selling uh, our program plastic, and uh, again, I'm going to talk about that here in just a moment. We're also seeing with barrier technologies on, on containers, uh, certain types of uh, product formulations require uh, barrier technologies in those containers. And so we're seeing some of those technologies come under uh, scrutiny, uh, particularly related to the PFAS issue. And so um, that's something that uh, you know, we're looking at closely just to make sure that it doesn't adversely affect uh, the recyclability of the plastic in our program. We're also looking at advanced recycling and how that could be um, a contingency plan for recycling of some of the plastic from our program long term. And then just generally speaking, the higher contractor collection costs that uh, they've been dealing with, with both labor and inflation, um, nothing that's uh, new to any of you that are close to ag, uh, that's a, a common problem. So we have been developing uh, new strategic pillars for our next five years of operation. Um, the graphic on the right uh, represents the, the uh, sort of a heat map, if you will, of agriculture in the U.S. and the areas of red uh, being the most ag-intensive counties uh, around the country. And so we're kind of keeping that top of mind all the time as we're looking at decisions of where we do what we do uh, within the ACRC program. Um, and so some of our contractor decisions, for example, were uh, with some of that in mind. But if you look at the, uh, the different areas where we're focused, I'm not going to go in these in detail because we don't have the time today, but ultimately we're looking to grow program funding in a couple of different ways. One is through, of course, increasing our membership, but also through looking at uh, potential for grant monies. Um, packaging legislation I'll touch on in more in a moment. We've talked about the contractor growth. One of the areas we're really focused on is trying to grow through retail. That's the most logical place, most efficient way for us to grow collection is at the ag retail level. Um, we're now shifting our focus more to promotion on plastic sales as opposed to just po promotion on the, the program itself, the collection program itself. We're really wanting to make sure that as we grow the volume, we have the sales to, to move all that plastic. Um, partnering with that is new end use market growth. So the areas that Lee is focused on, a couple that we're looking at is both advanced recycling and then also container to container or bottle to bottle recycling. Um, and so that's, a, that's an area that we're looking at as uh, quite hopeful over the next few years. And then lastly, plastic quality. This is a, a, a critical area that is fundamental to the Clean Means Clean campaign that I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, talking about the plastic sales uh, issues, um, these are a few of the things that we face uh, on a regular basis that are challenges to selling the plastic. Um, the plastic, ag chemical container plastic carries a stigma with it. Um, it contained chemicals, uh, oftentimes those chemicals smell, and so the plastic smells, and when you process the plastic, there's still sort of that odor, um, and so those are things that we have to deal with. There's just a general negative perception around it in, in general. Um, and then uh, we've also got, in some cases, relatively immature end-use markets that we're trying to develop. We've got the pressure from uh, other sources of either wide spec, spec or low price virgin resin. Um, and, and then uh, also particularly geography, depending on where we have volumes to sell and where the end users are, that's a, a huge challenge for us. So, this is sort of just a, a quick look at some of the initiatives that we're working on to try to uh, address some of those plastic sales issues. We're really looking all across the value chain, starting at growers and applicators all the way through to the end user manufacturer. So that includes collection sites, our contractors, and potential for processors. Um, I mentioned the Clean Means Clean, clean campaign. So that's uh, the strong uh, educational campaign that we've got going on. We're looking at quality assurance. We're going to be looking at doing quality audits to try to make sure that the plastic is as clean as we say it is and needs to be in order for it to sell successfully. 
Um, we're also looking at potential for increasing the use of uh, post-collection processing, things like washing, things like extruding and pelletizing to try to add value to the plastic to, again, increase the, um, the likelihood of sales. Um, building sort of a network around those processors nationwide. We're partnering with some of the pipe guys, for example, uh, to try to evaluate some of the pellets that we're, we're testing um, with some of those processors. And then uh, collaborating with specific end users um, to help develop that whole uh, supply chain. And then I also mentioned earlier um, a couple of new end-use markets, um, specifically advanced recycling and bottle-to-bottle -bottle or container-to-container. -container. All right, I want to shift gears for just a couple of minutes, and I'm not going to take very long on this, but I, this is more just an education. Think about these slides as a reference for you. If you think that y you or any of your stakeholders uh, may be uh, touched by packaging legislation in the near future, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to try to share what I, I do know. By no means am I an expert, but uh, sadly, over the last several years, I have become the expert within our industry <laughs> uh, by default. So um, for those of you who may have been wondering all morning, what is EPR? It's Extended Producer Responsibility. The Product Stewardship Institute, you can see their definition. Um, it's a, a mandatory type of stewardship that includes, at a minimum, the requirements that the manufacturer's responsibility for its product extends to the post-consumer management of that pro product and its packaging. Bottom line, it says that the, the producer, the brand owner of the packaging, owns the stewardship of that all the way through the end of its useful life. So they're going to bear the financial costs of managing that, that packaging at the end of its useful life. So there are now five states that have passed packaging EPR laws. Um, you can see the list there, California, Colorado, Maine, Minnesota, and Oregon. And Minnesota just passed uh, a couple of months ago, so that's the latest um, state. And uh, you can see that there are quite a few other states that are likely to pass in the near future. Uh, we are expecting that uh, literally in the next one to two years we will probably see Maryland and Illinois both pass because they have um, needs assessments going on right now. Um, ultimately, the ACRC is, is not uh, standing in opposition to packaging EPR. We're really trying to make sure that we are at least represented in terms of the role that we already play and want to play moving forward. Um, and so partnering with both state agency folks, legislators, um, with uh, what now are, the, you may have heard, heard the term producer responsibility organization or PRO. There's a PRO called Circular Action Alliance and we're partnering with them trying to figure out again how we're going to interact with them moving forward. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking now ahead to 2025 uh, because the, the 24 sessions are, are behind us, but we're expecting uh, over the next several years we're going to see maybe as many as at least five or more states to pass. Um, again, I'm, I'm sharing this as a resource. We don't have time to go into the detail. The bottom line is that there are various, uh, in each of these states, various exemption categories. Our industry will uh, involve a couple of exemption categories, uh, the biggest of which is FIFRA, or the um, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. That's uh, ultimately pesticides. Um, in some states, pesticides are exempt. Uh, but again, that's where our program comes in, and we're able to talk to those states and explain we already have a program that's stewarding those, uh, those products. But there's other types of exemptions as well. And so it looks like the primary impact to our industry is going to be non-registered products and household products. That'll be at least, at least those, but possibly others. Um, specifically, we're working in Oregon and Maine on, on exemption requests that we've submitted, again, trying to get recognition for the existing EPR program that we effectively run, a voluntary EPR program, and then um, also recognition of the existing uh, exemptions such as FIFRA and USDA uh, and OSHA exemptions. Um, for those of you who manage uh, IBCs, this is a chart that uh, helps you with understanding uh, which products may be affected in the area of both uh, bulk packaging, IBCs, and, and drums. And uh, again, just providing this as a resource. There are other areas of packaging legislation that are uh, emerging right now. Uh, recycled content mandates, which we wholeheartedly support because uh, ultimately that's what drive, will drive demand for the plastic that we're trying to sell. 
um, but also material bands, um, things like pigments, um, PETG uh, and PVC. There's a whole host of, of uh, material bands that are being considered and also chemical bands associated with things like PFOS. And then there's a, a, a myriad of, of labeling uh, laws or bills that are um, currently circulating and we're expecting all of these to impact our industry. Uh, so again, for those of you who have um, constituents or, or stakeholders that are in the ag um, chemical space or ag related packaging, you should definitely be aware of, of all of these. These are just contact, uh, contact information for the various state programs. Again, this is a resource if any of you or your stakeholders need this information, I'm providing that so that you can uh, have ready access to the people that know the most about the laws in those states. Okay, uh, that's the extent of my prepared comments, but happy to answer any questions there may be. Uh, Gerald Holmes, Strawberry Center, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, my question is about the residue that you're rinsing, given the variety of products and their formulations and the time between the, the last use and when it might be rinsed, it seems like it would be very difficult to get that out. Could you talk a little bit about that challenge? Of, sure. You know, something that was recently used versus something maybe that sat there for two years and hardened. Yeah, the bottom line is that we, we present to grower grower groups all the time and our messaging has been and will always be rinse at the time of use rinse at the time of use because to your point if you wait weeks or months um, rinsing a container will become very problematic and so the the uh, the real solution is to rinse at the time of use and field apply the rinse aid so that's that's the messaging that we give to growers every day Any other questions? Well, we have a table next door with literature and uh, happy to answer more questions as you stop by. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, last presentation is going to be on NetFM Certified Regen Recycling Program with Jesse Lee and Tate Kelly, both with NetFM. All right, everybody's leaving because it's lunchtime, but. <laughs> Alrighty, so today I'm presenting on our uh, Regen Recycling Program. I'll get more into it as it goes, but just to introduce myself, my name is Tate Kelly. I'm the Product Manager for Thin Wall Dripper Lines as well as FlexNet for NetFM USA. Um, we thought it'd be a good compliment for Jesse Lee to present as well. He is operations for a recycling facility in Fowler, California, so um, we'll give you some more in detail than I can on that. Um, before I start with the actual Regen Recycling, I did want to note on who NetFM is. Um, we are a global leader in irrigation solution technology. Um, that includes digital farming, drip irrigation is our main source, um, and then also filters, valves, so on. But um, we do have a factory uh, for drip lines, heavy wall and thin wall in Fresno, California, and then our recycling facility is right down the road um, in Fowler, California, about 30 minutes. So I think this is important to note, um, the history of uh, NetFM recycling, but really recycling in general, um, on the Central Coast anyway. Um, that is our main market um, for recycling dripper lines. Um, the history kind of goes where the California coast had heavy wall dripper lines or medium wall dripper lines. This could be 8 to 12 mil at the time. And what they would do is they would each winter when it was raining, the labor force would go in the barn and start splicing this thing together. Um, this would be pretty much all winter work. And when they put it back in the field for spring planting, it still did not, did not work. Either the splicing was too hard and it cut off flow 
or the dripper lines were not fixed correctly in, bringing it out of the field, nick the sides, and you would get more of a sprinkler solution than you would get a drip solution. Um, so NetFM really pioneered a single-use system with our NetFM Regen EZ. Um, it's basically just a thin wall product, four and a half, five mil, um, that, that we market a single use per year on the California coast specifically, but we also have locations down in the desert and here on as well. Um, just to speak, um, Jesse will um, more so on the complications, but um, the facility first opened as far as the idea in 07, as far as 16 plus years of processes and looking into how we can actually recycle back in to our dripper lines in Fresno and, and the world. Um, this has been a very difficult process. I've kind of reaped the benefits coming on just two and a half years ago where this has already been in store and um, we kind of have you know, the motor rolling, so to speak. So this is where we are today. Uh, we actually received two certifications from SCS Global Services. One of them is our pellets, and then the other one is actually the, the recycling facility in Fowler, California, as you can see on the screen. Um, SCS is, is the number one choice for um, end users like Costco and Walmart. Walmart actually recognizes them on their page as well, so that's why we went after SCS. So I'll spend a little time on how it works. Um, I think the rollout slash, uh, slash manufacturing is what really where I come in. Um, we manufacture in Fresno and we'll palletize as well as wrap it and ship it directly to the customer, sometimes to dealers who, who uh, then give it to the end user, but most of the time we're working directly with the grower. Um, the grower is my, my main um, target market and I am usually in the field um, talking with the grower and seeing how they think of our product uh, rolling out and, and also retrieving. So um, I don't think we could retrieve without Andros. I'll shout them out. Um, I know we have uh, also Theron here, um, but also a third party that, that really the Andros, Andros solution of a mega binder, ultra binder and efficiently rolling up drip irrigation out of the, out of the field is, is untouchable. Um, we really look for a perfect coil that we can actually uh, haul to Fowler, California, and we found it with Andros. So um, I have later slides on that. But um, the last the last step before we renew is recycling. I'll leave that to Jesse Lee. But uh, the renew is is really where I come in, where. Um, the recycled materials, the pellets, are transferred to Fresno, California, where we, where we will put a percentage into each one of our products. Um, the Streamline EZ is our main source. Um, Regen is a, now a global brand, um, and we will move forward with that into other products as well. So as I noted, the rollout, the retrieval, and the pickup um, really our grower partners, I don't think we can do it without them. I know I shouted out Andros, but I'm working in the field with these growers every day. And uh, the installation, the retrieval, and the storage. The storage is pretty underrated. We require these growers to hold on site until we pick up. Um, that is a huge liability for them regarding, there is pesticides that move through this, uh, through this pesticides, herbicides, so on, that move through this drip irrigation, as well as sulfuric acid to clean out the dripper lines. Holding this on site where they have to store other materials such as tractors, such as equipment, um, they do take up that space with our dripper lines until we pick it up. Um, once again, the retrieval, Andros engineering, the Andros shanks to install, um, if you guys have ever been on a grower, you will see orange shanks on an actual uh, installation machine. That is the best you can get. There's a reason why. We have a hard emitter in our dripper lines. If you do not want to nick that emitter going into the field. I know Toro has a continuous flow path, which is easier to go in. Um, ours is definitely necessary to have those andro shanks. Um, and then the Megabound coil has already, already spoke to that. They also truck um, to, to Fowler, California. Thanks, Tate. Uh, please bear with me by work in operations. I'm surprised they let me out of the basement. Um, so here we, here we go. Um, you know, it's quite interesting the journey that, that NetFM's gone on. You know, we've, we've been dabbling in recycling for 
12, 16 years. No one quite actually knows that we've been doing it. We've been doing the circular economy before it was even coined or even cool. Um, and it's been pretty successful for us, but it's come with a very, you know, high barrier to entry. There's There's been a lot of learning that's gone along um, throughout this process. Um, you can see in, in this slide here, um, just on the right, the, the process, right? So you've got the flake that we start with, right? We start with the mega bound coils. Um, there's no point in showing that, but then we, we turn into a flake. You can see the dirt that comes out of it, so you can imagine what that does to the equipment. Below that, it's pretty hard to see, but that's just a mixed stream of different materials that, that go into ag, ag plastics. You've got different connectors of nylon, acetal, PVC. Uh, I think there's some stocks in there, some organics. So it, there's a lot of different contaminants that, that are in these pipes. And somehow through our process, we make a, a clean pellet that's clean enough to go back into you know, crosshead extrusion. Um, so really, Moving on to the, the growth of the operation, you know, since 2021, we've we've produced, you know, in terms of good pellets, tens of millions of pounds um, that have gone back into our own own product. Um, you know, it's grown from a, a small operation to where we are now. Um, if you would ask me 10, 11 years ago when I first started Netafim as a production supervisor, hey, we're going to make the thinnest, you know, that that five mil product that you made that gives you a bunch of scrap. Well, we're going to make a thinner product. And we're going to put recycled material. I would have told you you're out of your mind, but you know we've we've really invested in, into the equipment, the infrastructure, to make this possible. Um, you know we've we've benefited largely because we are vertical, almost nearly vertically integrated in what we do. Um, so we produce a pellet that goes back to our own manufacturing facilities. So having that that relationship and then having Netafim having invested heavily into data acquisition, SCADA systems, MES platforms, we can make an adjustment to our to our recycling process and see how that how that affects the the um, the final product that goes to the customer. And it's important for us, you know, because we are, you know, as a recycling plant manager, you know, my customer is the extrusion plant, but that still goes to the farmer and you know we we warranty our products and you know, some of those things, products we offer warranties up to eight years, but we all know how salespeople work, right? They'll, oh, this product's been here for 20 years, but we'll warranty it too. So we're really, we've really done a lot of testing to make sure that what we're doing in our process doesn't, you know, degrade the material and it will last in this environment, you know, for many, many years. Um, um, like I mentioned, it's very, very costly and even harder to perfect. Um, we're investing with, in new technologies investment. I just got done installing a $400,000 piece of equipment last week. Um, we're continuing to invest in it. And even to the point where we're finding as, you know, a manufacturer or processor that there's gaps in what's even available out there that's being offered by these recycling, you know, companies, right? They're selling equipment, but we're finding maybe in our unique area that, you know, we've had to design our own things and build them, you know, 100% in-house to meet the specific requirements of this, of this product. So I think it's important to note Netafim's commitment to this. We're continuing to, to fund capital investments and in, in growth. We've invested, you know, millions of dollars over the past several years in in providing new equipment technologies that will make it, you know, safer, more efficient, and ultimately driving that quality piece because we're not going to turn turn our backs to that. Um, I think it's important. I think uh, Dr. Stephen Wong mentioned, you know, a lot of recyclers end up going bankrupt, especially in California. Netafim, you know, is committed to operating. You know, this past this past year or past two years has been really difficult, and you know, there's been times where we've operated at a loss, but we're going to continue doing it because in the long run, it's good for everybody and we're not going to stop. Um, continuing in, in our commitment, we've, we've recognized the importance of recycling and the creating of a global recycling role. So I've actually transitioned roles and now, aside from being the plant manager, I'm also in charge of all the other 
recycling operations and technology that are happening globally within, within NetFM. Um, we are expanding our foot, footprint abroad as well. With the success of what we've done in Fowler, we've now opened a plant in Culiacan, Mexico. Um, with anticipation for growth there, we're talking about expanding and laying the groundwork for expansions into other markets as well. Um, and another area that we're, we're looking to get back into is the collection of, of heavy wall. We started really, we really started in doing the heavy wall or the, the um, tubing that you see out in orchards, but with the coastal market, you know, that really shifted our focus. Now we've, we've done a better job at driving efficiencies that we realize that there's a lot of this other hard to recycle, hard to transport, you know, the, the density of the material is difficult to work with. So we're looking at getting back into that and, you know, and producing that and sending it back to our factories. Um, and then lastly, you know, we're working also with outside of Netafim, we have sister companies that are looking to, to break into using PCRs and I think there's a, there's a bright future ahead for Netafim and our, our sister companies. I wanted to spend a little time on who wins. Um, I think the benefit to the grower was where we started. Um, that is our target market at NetFM, and we went to them first. Um, we saw right away the sustainability factor was the hot word of the year, um, and really moving forward, they don't see it disappearing. Um, they need to go to the Costco's, the Walmarts, the Trader Joe's, and they need to prove why they're sustainable on their farm, whether it's reduced packaging, whether it's 360 economy, re recycling with our dripper lines. That's the key that we're looking for, and, and they gave us it right away. They gave us the thumbs up. We need this. We're going to move forward with it. Um, so. I think we noticed right away the sustainability, but also the environmental in impact that we've seen. The waste reduction, obviously the landfills were getting full. Um, even with that eight mil product that lasts multiple years, it still ended up in the landfills. There was no true recycling that could do it, make it full circle. And then the resource efficiency, obviously you're only using these products once. Where does it go after that? We'll pick it up for you. We don't offer you to you don't have to pay at all, we'll do it for you. Um, we believe as a, as a NetFM supplier that we own the product until it's back into our own product. Um, and then the carbon fr footprint, I'll leave that as is. We haven't studied too much on the effects of our carbon footprint, but we do know we want to expand to other, other states. You know, Florida was noted earlier of the, uh, the burning. I've seen it firsthand over there. I mean, the mulch, um, and then they'll throw in some dripper lines here and there too. It's, uh, it's disappointing to see, but we, uh, we do have a solution. Um, just to round out what we do, um, we do recognize our foundational partners. Our foundational partners are on the screen on that laptop. Uh, Braga Fresh, Church Brothers, Tanner Marin Ansel, and Andy Boy DiRigo just signed. Um, we're not stopping here. We're going to get every grower on the coast, and we're going to get every shipper on the coast because um, they're going to follow suit. Um, as you heard earlier, um, brother follow brother, farmer follows far farmer, like they, they are going to follow suit on this. It means something to them. They're going to buy an FM drip tape. Um, lastly, this is what you get when you do join the Advantage program. Um, it is, that, that's our logo there. Um, and you also get a certification program. You could post, um, if you saw on LinkedIn, um, DiRigo just post um, our partnership and, and also posted our link. So you can either follow them on LinkedIn, please follow us, but uh, we, we, we are moving forward with this. Um, we, don't, we don't plan on stopping. I'll leave Jesse Lee for the end, and uh, yeah, thank you guys very much. They let me back. So, um, I think the future is really bright when when we look at ag ag plies, especially around the the tubing and the tape. You know, but we are looking out there, and we only know what we know, and we we can only do so much. So one of the shifts in our, our thinking is that we're, we're open and willing to, to partnerships in, in trying to grow this operation and seek out you know, synergies amongst other growers, manufacturers, and recyclers. Um, you know, really, it's a benefit to the customer, it's a, it's a benefit to the environment, and really it's the right thing to do. So 
Um, you know, if you see us, we'll be here all week. You know, flag us down. We'll be happy to have a conversation. You know, and talk about what what we could potentially do. So, I think that's that's the last slide. There's Tate's Tate's contact information. So, feel free to blow him up. And um, want to thank you. And I guess we'll open this up for questions. Um, just have one quick question. How much recycled content is in your drip tape? I'll publish numbers here pretty soon. It's up to a certain amount. It'll be roughly 25%. I'm going to tell you it's going to be a hell of a lot more than that moving forward, though. And another additional question. How long have you guys been using recycled content in your drip tape? Since Easy's launch, which is... What, 2012? 2020? Yeah, 20, 20, the end of 2019, I believe, as officially recycled content in there. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. My name is Julio Serrano with Free Point Ecosystems, chemical recycling company. My question is, how much are you recycling and how much are you producing on a monthly basis? And are you only using your product or are you using the other agricultural folks as well? I'll come in with the um, operational jargon here. So that's, that's been redacted on my end from my boss, but we, we produce million, tens of millions of pounds per, per year. Um, I can't give a, I'm not allowed to give a actual number. Um, we do, we primarily target our own material just because we chain of custody but we also process our, our, some of our competitors. We've done extensive testing and qualifying the material ahead of time to know that it's compatible with what we're producing. And then we, you know, obviously we do a, a quality check on all of our material, you know, post, post pelletizing prior to production. Igor from Scrap Management. Uh, first off, excellent presentation. I think you guys knocked it out of the park. Uh, my question is, how do you deal with the plastic impurities once you've shredded and washed and taken out the dirt component? You mentioned there's some nylon and some other things in there. How do you handle that? Currently, we don't have a very good solution for that. So, you know, the reality is a lot of that material is making it to landfills. We do have several secondary processes to try to recapture as much of the plastic as possible. So hence, you know, the, the conversation about partnerships to try to find, you know, maybe there's some niche processor out there that's that wants to use this really, you know, wide range of materials to build some some unique product. So So you can I can't go really into like the proprietary processes that we, we do. Um, you can look at what, you know, we do operate a wash line and, and a pelletizing line. You can, you can see how those, those type of contaminants will be removed in a wash line. You know, if you've got the money, anybody can buy a wash line and a pelletizer and make pellets. It's all the learned knowledge and experience that goes along with it, so. Work for it. Hello, great presentation. Um, my name is Gwyneth. I'm with Washington State University. I was curious what percentage of the growers who use your um, drip tape are recycling with you, and also how that process just works for them. Do they just send you an email when they're ready for pickup, or you know, what does that look like? Yeah, so 100% of the NetFM users that use, use our drip tape in the field will come back to Fowler, California. It will be recycled. It will be picked up by us, us being an extension, being Andros, right, or a third party that we have hired, um, or Theron. I mean, but we have, a lot of, we have a lot of partners in the field, but that comes back to us. Um, 
that's our partnership, how they get in touch with us. Obviously we have salesmen nearby. Um, they're in touch with the growers every day, but also um, there's by contact information on our website. I believe it's our website and then underneath it, there's a recycling right there and you can see my contact. So that's how it gets started. Is this live? Um, maybe you already have answered it, but uh, you mentioned earlier that there are um, pesticides that flow through the drip tube, and I was just curious um, how you guys address uh, avoiding cross-contamination when you take that uh, plastic regrind and then put it back into new tube. Do you guys uh, have to do any special testing or uh, you mentioned having a wash line and then re-extruding and pelletizing so I'm assuming that that's part of the process but is there any testing to make sure that there's no pesticide residues that end up in the new tube? Yeah we QC check everything both in our factory of dripper lines as well as at QC in Fowler California so the wash line definitely that's that's the answer um, but yeah it's a huge thing that we focused on right away um, given the fact that farmers do fertigation be using our dripper lines that's that is the key and sulfuric acid another one too to clean out that just to follow up this may be confidential and so feel free to say you can't answer this but uh, your wash line is it a hot wash or a cold wash sorry but you know the answer <laughs> <laughs> You got a 50-50 shot. Yeah. It depends on the ambient temperature. How about that? <laughs> Come on, guys. Keep pressing in them. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh, one more. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Um, what do you do with the wastewater? So that was a major, major factor when we, we expanded, you know, really in 2020. We have a closed loop filtration system. So all the water that we use to, to wash, you know, the dirt, the mud, the plastic residue that get in there goes through a closed loop system where we, we cycle it, you know, we filter it out and then we return it back in. We have monitoring built into that so that we monitor that because we've, we, we understand the impact of water quality and and how well you can get the get the plastic to be clean. So. All right, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I don't want to keep you guys waiting from lunch for too long, so we can kind of conclude this session, and we'll be back at one. Thank you.